We thank you that you're here. Uh, God, we're thankful that you are who you are and you do what you do. And God, that we can receive it all. And so, Father Lord, as we continue to just talk about deliverance, to talk about freedom, talk about all that you have for us, and God, that's my prayer for this church, for our body, for myself, Father, for every family and every individual, God, that we would receive all that you have for us. Uh, God, I pray that whatever is hindering us from receiving from you, Father, whatever lies we may believe, whatever life situations we may find ourselves in, whatever walls we may have put up, uh, whatever things the enemy has caused in our life, Father, Lord, to distract us from your truth or from receiving from you, Father, Lord, we pray to you that your name is above every other name, and God, that in the name of Jesus, these things can be demolished and we can receive all that you have for us. So, God, we pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, so uh, last week was, was a fun week, and uh, in short, we said, don't be stupid. Uh, we are not God. God is God, and when we start to recognize that, then we can uh, humble ourselves before Him, come before Him, and, and receive all that He has for us. We were mentioning a little bit last week, we can get a little prideful, we do our own thing, and we're okay with that. We're that's how we flow. That's how we go. Uh, so today we're going to be looking at 2 Corinthians, starting in uh, chapter 10. We're going to read verse 3 through 5 this morning. Uh, and I believe we're going to continue to receive some things. So God would have some more truth for us to receive. And will help us get out of the situations, the bondage, the traps, the habits, the addictions that we may find ourselves in. And because we know that his word is true today, it hasn't changed, it hasn't lessened, the power is still the same, the message is still the same. And so if he says there's freedom for us to have, or if he says that there's more for us to do by his spirit, then we as a church want it. And I hope that's your cry too. I want it. I want that freedom. Um, so let's look here. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, and we're going to read verse 3 through 6 this morning actually says this, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your, dis once your obedience is complete. I'm going to look at the time this week so I know where I'm at. Uh, the last couple weeks I haven't looked at the time. So I know where I'm at now. We're going to be good and we're going to continue on. So the, in, in this passage, uh, we will begin to realize today that our issues, our, uh, our addictions, our habits, these things that we find in ourselves that are not like Christ is not an outward uh, situation that's happening. It's actually an inward process. And we're going to begin to take captive the things that are happening inside of us until we reach complete victory. And in Christ, again, it has this mighty, mighty thing that we're going to make everything submissive to Christ so that we, and in Christ, we have that divine power to conquer all these things that are happening inward. I don't know about you, last, last week I kind of gave you that example of an IT guy, and he's working on the computer, you know, or, or we have, I have an issue with the computer, the IT guy doesn't. And I call an IT guy in, and usually, what will he say? It's not the computer, it's actually the user, right? It's, it's me. We're going to continue in that thought throughout the, the message again. And find that, yes, it's an inward thing about me. It's not the outward thing. And many times in our life when we're facing an addiction or facing a problem, we always, sometimes we try to change the outward thing, the situation. Maybe we get a new job, we get a new house, we move this location. We think, oh, we've got to change some kind of outward thing. When actually the, the scripture here says it's an inward thing, something that's within us that is causing a problem. Anybody, anybody here, have you ever felt trapped before? 
I remember one of my uh, one of my experiencing feeling trapped was one of the first times Rachel and I were traveling back from Kentucky. We we're in Kentucky and we we're traveling up to Madison, and it was my first time experiencing Chicago traffic. <laughs> I don't know if you guys are from the city or, or uh, your experience with traffic. And, you know, I remember when I was a kid in Southern California going into San Diego, traffic, or at least the memory of traffic that I remember of, is everybody's like stopped. There'd be like a sea of red, uh, of, of red lights. Everybody stopped there. What was interesting about my experience in Chicago is everybody wasn't stopped. <laughs> You're in the middle of six lanes of traffic. Everybody's going, not 70, they're going like 80 miles per hour, and you're just trapped in the middle. And so me, not being used to interstate uh, driving at all at the first place, and then being in the middle of that, I mean, it was like the worst experience that I could ever imagine. I was like, I can't wait till we get back to, we had just driven through Indiana. So it was like nice, wide open highway, the whole way flat, you know, you could see everything, you could see every turn, and boom, you hit Chicago. 70 miles per hour, 80 miles per hour, everybody's going, thousands of cars all around you, everybody moving in and out of the way, and I mean, I, it was a mis miserable experience, but in that moment, you know, I, could, I couldn't let Rachel know that, I just had my the grip on my <laughs> got a little bit tighter, I can't wait till I get out of here, and I, I, I didn't want, I didn't want to admit to Rachel at all, but I was in fear for our lives, but at that time, we already have a small car right now, you guys think that our little Honda Civic is small. We at that time we had what we called our um, our go kart. go kart. It was a it was a Saturn Ion. So it was even if you could have been a smaller car than our in the middle of all that traffic. Oh Lord! Can't wait. All I can think of. I know once I get past Chicago, it's open highway, open highway, open highway. But that's what we're talking about through these last couple messages. Sometimes we get in those situations where we feel trapped by it. We can't get out. It always and, and sometimes we want to identify ourselves with with the entrapment that we find ourselves in, right? We want to name it. We want to we want to talk. I, want, I for me it was more probably of a pride thing. I didn't want to say that I was scared of, of the situation with everybody weaving in and out. You know, but we find ourselves we find ourselves in that place that we're trapped. And we know we kind of look through. Sometimes when people talk about it. You know, you think go to go to your happy place, right? If you don't, you're claustrophobic. You don't like being on a bus or, or being in the being in the uh, on a flight, and, and you like, go to your happy place. Well, today uh, we're going to talk about our happy place. Our happy place is found in Jesus. And he is our way of escape. He is our, our hope. And no matter where we find ourselves in, no matter what trap we find ourselves in, there is a way of escape. We don't just have to think happy thoughts. We don't have to think about how it would be when it's different. In the middle of what we're going through, in the, in, the, in the problem that we find ourselves in, there is a way of escape. His name is Jesus. So what we have to practice or start practicing is stop looking at the problem and, and start looking into the opening. Start looking to Jesus. That God is going to show us his way of escape. The issue is not what's happening on the outside of us. It's not what, it wasn't the traffic in the moment. It was not internally, I thought I was going to die. I was believing these lies. I was believing, hey, somebody's going to cut me off. I'm going to ram into the next person. Who knows when the 70 mile per hour traffic is going to go to zero mile per hour. And the, out, the, the issue many times I believe is on the outside something that needs to change. And really it's on the inside. So here we find Paul speaking, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. How does this all, how does this all going to mend together? He's talking about a stronghold here. And maybe my traffic situation didn't pass, so maybe it wouldn't qualify as a stronghold. Maybe some of the, but we find ourselves in these habits and these things, and we find ourselves in the writer here, Paul, he says that these things are like strongholds, these addictions, these habits, these things that we find ourselves in, they're, they're strongholds. The world would call them, a common language would say, hey, these are addictions, these are habits that they're having. But a stronghold is a fortified thought or a way that we process life. Things that have happened to us, beliefs that we've adopted, that we've talked about worldviews, those kind of things, it becomes then a stronghold, something that stands itself up against the truth of who God is. And in verse 3, it gives this real life, uh, um, this real life application that it says we walk in the natural, we wage war in the spiritual. 
These are things that we come in contact with our life. We act in our life. We do in our life. And they, they're all in the natural. These are the things that we've learned or things that we've done. But they have a, this writer here, the scripture wants to tell us that it's not just these natural things. It's not just these outside forms. There's a spiritual thing behind everything we do, behind every action, behind every habit that we find ourselves in. And the way that we walk is not the way that we war. Or what we're dealing with, it doesn't just have a natural cause, it's of a spiritual nature. And the writer here, the scripture wants to tell us, and the truth that we want to get inside of us, that though we walk in the natural, our warfare, it takes place in the supernatural. The habits and the addictions, the life situations that we find ourselves in, all have a spiritual underlying. We must recognize that we can deal with these natural, we can't deal with these in the natural way. Like I said earlier, sometimes we want to, what, change our environment, right? Sometimes to get out of our situation, we'll, we'll move to a new place. Or, or sometimes we have all these issues at work, and so, man, the best thing is going to be if I just get a new job. So we try to get a new job. Or we, I, we, we know people, it, they, they want a new spouse, or, or they want a, a, a new location. They, you've got to change something. I'm trying to change my situation. I'm going to, I'm going to flee. I'm going to get out of this place because, hey, it's, what's going on on the outside. But most of the change is not outward, it's actually the inside. The real battle is not in the natural, it is taking place in the spiritual. And if we don't address the spiritual nature of things, then we'll never get the freedom that God wants for us this morning. And so that's what the scripture is going to encourage us in. Let's figure out how to battle these things in a spiritual realm when we find in the natural we're stuck. It's not more willpower. It's not if I could try harder. If anything, we tried hard and we got ourselves in the situation that we're in. So I can't change where I'm at. I got myself into this place. I got myself into this mess. I, I did what I wanted and I got this result and now I'm stuck here. I, I didn't agree with this teaching about the word, so I did what I thought was best, and I found myself now in this mess. I, I was the one that thought it should be done this way, and I did it that way, and I found myself, now I'm in sin. Uh, one of my speakers that I like to listen to, he said, and it, it's really interesting that the, the spelling of sin, that I is right in the middle of it. Yeah. I like that. That I did it, I did it, I did it, I, I did this way, and now I find myself trapped in this, and now it's going to take some spiritual discipline to get out of it. Your willpower alone cannot get you out of the trap that you find yourself in. This is what caused the fall in the first place. Right? The logic got slipped up in, in Eve, and did, it, did God really say that? And, and she went after her own desire. But the way of a Christian, the way of a real Christian, the walk of a real Christian is what? To die to sell daily, to pick up our cross, and to follow Jesus, Luke 9.23, right? So if, if I got myself in the mess, if I got myself in the bad habit, if I got myself in the sin situation, to get out of it, I can't rely on myself. I've got to rely on Jesus. He is the way of the Spirit. We've got to say to ourselves, Jesus, I want what you desire. Last week we talked about this. Okay? We're allowing the Spirit of God to work out through our mind, our will, and our emotion, through all of who we are. We've got to be determined to say that, Jesus, you are my Lord, or you are my boss, you are my leader, you are my director. You are in control of every area of my life. Because you are greater than what I desire, what I want, what I think, how I do things. You might say, this is impossible. And that's when you come like, yeah, this is impossible to think like God. I mean, he thinks so contrary to the way I think about forgiveness, about money, about relationships, about, I mean, about making peace. I mean, it's all contrary to the way that I naturally think. But this is why he's given us his spirit. This is why it says in Romans that his spirit, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, is now in us. Why? To give us life. Yes, in my natural, by myself, it's impossible. But the way that we walk in the natural is not the way that we fight. It's supernatural. That's right. This is grace that God would give His Spirit to us and enable us to look more and more like Him. Yeah. If we understand the way that we war is not how we walk, then we won't be confused. 
by how we get free from our addictions and our habits. The way that we walk is not how we war. We realize that God has given us spiritual weapons to destroy these strongholds. We've got to be counterculture. No more identifying with who our sin nature says we are. Because some of us think that our identity should be tied to what we've done, what our captive is. I am this. You know, we could I, I would talk about 12 steps and I identify with that thing. But there's a constant time in Christ that we no longer identify with who we were in our sin, but we identify with Christ and what he says about us. Yes. That I'm no longer just Andrew Castro. I am Andrew Castro, but a child of God. Yes. Amen. Right? We, Jesus has made a difference in our lives. I love the scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it's talking about all these different sin issues, all these different identifiers, adulterers, stealer, or, uh, somebody, sorry, a thief, uh, somebody who's a liar, all these, lists all these things. And then Paul goes to the good news in, in verse 11. He says, such were some of you. I love the gospel because it has that past tense about who we were prior to Christ. That prison that we once found ourselves in, now he comes to give us freedom, and he says, now you were this, but now you are righteous. You are a child of God. You are loved. You are significant. Some of us are still stuck in that cycle of, I can't break it, I can't overcome it, I can't help it, I just, this is who I am. And it sounds like a, a, you're a prisoner of war, but Jesus has the victory for Amen. us. It is a spiritual battle. That's what, to, that was, that's what 2 Corinthians 10 describes to us, that it is a spiritual battle that we're going through. And the way that we go in the natural is not how we're going to receive the victory. It's not just uh, holding on to that steering wheel, white-knuckling it through. It's leaning into all that he has for us. It's not... Changing job. It's not changing uh, the neighborhood. It's not changing the wife. It's not changing leadership. And we're dealing with issues with a spiritual implication. You ever wonder why, uh, you ever have a leadership issue with somebody in charge of you, and maybe they're, they're struggling to take care of the situation? It, it, it's a spiritual issue. It's not just a natural one. And if it's a spiritual issue, then we must, we must deal with it with, a, with spiritual weapons. We should, never, we should never criticize our leadership. The Bible says to pray for our leaders. Because they're trying to do, and they're trying to deal with natural things, right? They're trying to set things in order. You know, we talk about the president, and talk, and say he's trying to set things in order. We talk about your boss at work, they're trying to set things in order. Here at the church, man, we're trying our best to, to set things in order. And, and in the natural, things may look out of order. Uh, Things that we're trying to put in order can't just be put in order by better plans, by better techniques, or anything of that nature. Right. It must come through spiritual foundation, through spiritual yes. uh, advancements. Why? <laughs> Why does the Bible say to pray for our leaders and authority? It's because that they're walking in the natural, but they're sleep and they're walking and they're leading in the natural, but there's a supernatural implication to everything that they're trying to lead through. Talk about race issues and the <coughs> talk about the job things and, and economic freedom and all these. I mean, this is a supernatural things that are taking place, spiritual things that are taking place. And we need a higher source of power. We need to appeal to heaven. I need your prayers. Pastor needs your prayers. Your leaders have, in your workplace and leaders in this country, they need our prayers because what they're trying to set in order in the natural actually has spiritual undertone, has spiritual implications. We need to pray for our authorities. Many times we try to, when we get back to ourselves, I've got a little tangent, we get back to ourselves. The problem is that we elevate the issue instead of elevating the answer. We elevate the issue instead of elevating the answer. In our personal life, I'm guilty of that. I have a problem, and I'm trying to deal with the problem, so I talk about the problem, I think about the problem, I look at the problem. I try to solve the problem, and we, we elevate it, and we give it strength in our life. Oh, I, I have this problem because this is in my life, and this is in my life, and we give it validation and, and reasons why I'm going through this issue. We elevate the issue instead of the answer. 
Because some of us are stuck in our default mode. Because I'm this or because I'm that or because this has happened to me or, or this didn't happen to me this way. It could be true. There could be factors into why you are who you are today. But the issue is not the issue. The outside force is not the issue. It's on the inside. And you are a child of God. You are an overcomer. You are a man or woman of God. You are righteous. You are favored. You are free. You are significant. Your identity is not in what you do. It's who you are. Our ability to overcome these things rely on our, our desire or our momentum or our walking in us changing our thought patterns. Here's what it lays out in 2 Corinthians. The writer says... That how do we overcome these things? How do we overcome these things? We don't war the way we walk. We have weapons that have divine power to destroy and dismantle, to pull down, to tear apart the things that the enemy has spoken to us. I love it. I, I love it. Those moments where all of a sudden I get I get a truth. You guys have a moment. You, you get a truth from God. You, you hear about His love, and all of a sudden, boom! It hits you, and you're like, "Yes, that's free," and it, it frees you from things, right? And there's moments in my life where, man, I come in contact with the truth, and it, it transforms the way I think about something. And then other times, it's a process. It's a process of, man, I, this truth hits me, but now I gotta undo all these things that I thought the way things were supposed to be. It's a process, it's not an event. I wish it were, man, in one moment we could change everything about who we are and, and everything will go free. We free in the moment, but we have to continue in the process of tearing down the stronghold, renewing our mind, renewing those thoughts, rewiring who we are. We talked about that uh, a few weeks ago. We, sometimes we get so used to the lights being off, we just think we'll become nocturnal without checking the wiring. No, we've got to check the wiring. We found ourselves in the sin habit. We find ourselves in the thing. We've got to figure out what thought patterns have developed in our mind that now we find ourselves over and over again going back to, like the word says, going back to our vomit, like a dog goes back to our vomit. Yeah. The weapons that we have are, 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 are not carnal. They're not just of this world. They're not just trying harder. They're divine. Yes. If we understand the battle is not outside, but it's inside... He said it's caused by lofty opinion, by arguments, by thoughts, contrary to what? Contrary to the word, contrary to Christ, contrary to the truth. They're strongholds. Yes. They're ways that we think. And some of us have been operating in these thought patterns for such a long time that they're even subconscious to us. We, we don't know why all of a sudden a stressful situation happens and then we go right back into this, right? We go right back into our, our, our sin habit. Uh, I, got a, I have a temper issue and all of a sudden, boom, I, I get a, I'm doing good, I'm treating people right, I mean, and then all of a sudden stress happens. Maybe somebody cuts me off, maybe my, my child gets, uh, acts in a way that I, I don't agree with. And uh, something, all of a sudden stress comes in and boom, I'm right back, uh, subconsciously, and all of a sudden, boom, I'm, I'm raging again. How's that happen? It's these stop patterns that we have set up in our mind. And the only way that we're going to free ourselves from these things is by tearing them down by the Word of God, by Christ. Our stronghold is not just, uh, not just our outward thing we're going to, whatever chemical thing we're going to, whatever emotional thing we're going to. It's not whatever bottle we're going to. It's not, uh, it's not whatever expression. Our outward expression is an expression of our inward thoughts and our patterns of our lives. problem and habit is an expression of the things, the thought patterns that are our lives. And how do, how do we fix it then? We've got to fix the thought associated with it. We keep going back to the drugs. We keep going back to the, the anger habit. We keep going back to the, uh, the pattern. We keep fleeing from the situation. We keep hiding from this good that uh, willpower works maybe for a little while, but that stress happens. Boom, all of a sudden we find ourselves back then. We've got to destroy the thoughts in our lives. I wrote down here something really specific, so I'm trying to get this real quick. So let me look here. Until we change the thoughts or our beliefs, you keep on going back over and over again. So 
So now we know the cause, how we find ourselves in these situations. So we've got to figure out how do we break this? How do we break these cycles? What's the cure? So I know I find myself going back to these things. I know I find myself having these same thoughts. I know I find myself going back over and over again to the same vomit. Disgusting vomit. Yeah, it is. <laughs> 2 Corinthians chapter 10, let's look at that verse 5. This is how we cure ourselves. This is how we overcome. We demolish arguments and every pretense, or the ESV, I like it, says this way, is every lofty idea that self sets itself up against the knowledge of God. So how do we get free from our addiction? How do we get free from our habits? How do we break free from the stronghold that we find ourselves in? We have to go after the foundation. Destroy the foundation. Destroy the foundation of that stronghold. Where did that lie creep into my heart? What lie, sometimes we have to identify, what lie am I believing that this is better than what God has to offer me? Yeah. In every sin habit, we can trace it back to a lie that we believed about God, and we can cling to the truth, and it will free us. It will break the foundation. It will overcome that stronghold. And so we believe as a church that the Bible talks about forgiving our enemies. Forgiving those who trespass against us, right? And I know in the natural it doesn't make sense. Last time I, I shared that example of playground situation, right? Or and we want to defend ourselves. Man, we want to bring revenge. Man, that you wronged me. That's how we think. It boggles our mind when Christ says, forgive our enemies. Love them. Show them what they don't deserve. Why? <laughs> because we don't deserve His grace. Amen. And sometimes, all of a sudden, we have this lie that we believe inside of us that we deserve something better. Right. And so when people mistreat us, all of a sudden we get this thought, I deserve better than this, and that's what causes this anger. And we don't even know that that's a lie that we actually deserve worse. That's right. Anybody know what scripture I'm talking about? The Bible says that we deserve the penalty of our sin, it is death. So then forgive me nothing, all of a sudden, wow, if I had something I deserve, man, forgive me. Uh, if I've been forgiven this much, man, forget. It becomes an easy thing. It rewires the way that we think. Instead of God's thoughts, and we must implement them in our minds. Will I think how God is wanting me to think? Am I willing to replace the wiring that I've made for myself with what God says? Because the easy question is, how is it working for you thinking the way you've thought all your life? And if we're really honest, we can say, hey, it hasn't turned out very well for me. But I promise you, as we think like Christ does, as we rewire ourselves like He does, man, the results are always full of His goodness. Yes, right. different characters. They can hear you. They can hear me over there, too. Yeah. I can hear you. You can hear me? Yeah. That's good, Denver. I like that. When I was a kid. <laughs> I used to, I, I, I still know a lot. I, when I was a little kid, I know, I apologize. I probably knew too much and was like always, always a know it all. Um, Why are great I know how things should go. I know how things would come out. Man, I know a whole lot when I was really young. Anybody else in the room? When you're, oh, sure. You know a lot. Yes. Your parents try to tell you how things should be. Why? Because they've been around for a little bit longer. They've seen kind of the end results of situations. Wisdom. They have a lot of wisdom. 
They know how things are going to come out. But yet we still, as little kids, just love to try to do our own thing, figure it out our own way. No, I got this. Anybody, uh, I got this? Yeah. No, I don't need your help. I got this. Isn't it parallel in this to our Heavenly Father, who has a lot of wisdom, who's been around a while, who knows how things are going to turn out, but somehow we still got a thought in our mind that, hey, we got this. I know how this is going to go. God, I, don't worry, God. You're telling me how it's good, but you know what? I know how I, know how I can treat my friends. Or I know how I need to deal with my finances. I know how I need to treat my household. I know how to put things in order. We still got this. We still got this pattern in our minds and somehow we got it figured out. But Father is in heaven. He loves us. And I remember those moments when I would try to figure things out on my own and I would end up in the wrong place and Mom and Dad would sweep me up in their arms and still be there to say, I love you. But this is why I told you this because I knew this was going to happen. And our Heavenly Father is the same way. He wants to sweep us up in the arm, and He wants to lovingly correct us and say, Hey, I had the foresight. I knew it was coming. I knew it was on the way. And He's not there in that moment to shame us. He's not there to condemn us. He's there to embrace us and to say, Here's the truth. Help, let's replace this thinking in your life. This stinking thinking. I want to replace this with truth in a way that you're going to live out a life that's full of my goodness, that's just like me, to receive all that I have for you. Amen. So when we come here on Sunday morning, we hear the word spoken. When we're in our devotion, then we're hearing the word spoken. It's encouraging us, and it's building us up. When we're at our MCs, and we're surrounded by the word of God, and we're talking about the word of God, and all those moments, it's the, it's the Lord's voice to us. He, he's wanting to replace these thoughts. He wanted to renew our mind. He's wanting to rewire us. So if you think like him, to demolish every stronghold, that we will have the victory. Because this battle is not in the natural, it's in the spiritual. And the only way that we're going to get out of these things is if we replace these things with the Spirit of God. Yes. Yes. God is with us. He's here to show us the way to freedom. The issues in our life are not the outside forces. It's not the things that have happened to us. It's inward, and we have to own that fact that it's inward, the way we think about things, the way we think about pleasure, the way we desire things. We say, God, rewire us so we can have your thoughts, have your ways, have your desires, have your will in our lives. Because all of these lies in our life, they act like partitions. These lofty ideas, these arguments that we have about how things should be ran, or how things, they're, they're like partitions. They divide us. You know what a partition is? Like a, it's like a curtain. Yeah. We, used to, we used to have these partitions we would put up, we could, like in a classroom setting, we could divide down the walls. So this room could have it, and then, you know, and the conversation over here could have that conversation, the conversation. But they block the flow. These arguments that we have, these, these thoughts, these lofty ideas, these things that we think the way things should go, they, they act as a, as a divider in our life to block the flow of the spirit into our life, to block the flow of the light. Just like in the natural, where it's weird, the, we have a curtain, a blackout curtain in my room. I love it. I, I have a big old street light right outside my window. I said it's the worst place to put a street light. In. So I love my blackout curtain. Put it up, and it blocks the light. That's some spiritual implication, guys. There, the enemy is a prince of the darkness. He rules in darkness. He loves to speak lies. But Christ came. And what did he say? I am the light of the world. How do you overcome darkness? You turn on the light. You, you ever turn on the light and you see light and darkness battling each other? Like, ah, I'm going to conquer you. I've never seen it. I don't know. If you've seen it, you know, let me know. We're going to record it one day. Maybe we'll start studying it. But when, when you turn on the light, what happens? Darkness flees in a second. It leaves, right, Denver? It leaves. Darkness leaves the moment we turn on the light. So when we find ourselves stuck in these patterns, when we find ourselves stuck in these habits, what do we, we've got to get more light. 
Just get all that we can get. Whether it means I want to, I want to turn on some spiritual music that feeds me. I want to read my word. I want to listen on my drive, my five minute drive from from my apartment to my workplace. Whatever it may be, I want to get the light, get the light, because it's going to undo all this thinking. Darkness only dominates when there's no light. Darkness only can dominate when there's no light. So bring in the light. More of Jesus. I talked about, I was going to wait to the end of our message and talk about kind of responding to the message, but hey, there's been some times over the last few weeks where we've been saying, hey Jesus, let's, let's respond, let's come and pray, let's spend some time in prayer and and. and we love it. Mom gets up here and she plays the piano and plays some nice music. And, and in that moment, we're not dismissing you. You don't have to leave when mom comes up and, and plays the piano. Amen. The best part of this whole gathering time is the fact that the presence of God is here. He meets with us. He meets with us also in our bedroom. Whenever we open the Word, whenever we take a moment to pray, man, boom, God meets with us, right? But a special thing when we're gathered here together on Sunday morning is God loves to gather with his people. He loves to gather with his family. So when we're here on Sunday morning, after we hear a great message, and man, the words that hit us, and we're like, yes, that's for me, and God, I want this, and I want this to be a part of my life. Man, don't, you don't have to leave. We decided, so hey, we could just sit. Yes. Or we could come and kneel. And we say, God, work on me. Yes. God, read through that wiring. Whether we're going through this series or another series or it's another topic, we say, God, help that become who I am. And so sometimes I just come down here and I pray that. I say, God, yes, I want that. Get it in me. I don't know what else to pray. Yeah. And sometimes I do. I confess it because, you know what, I know that, that uh, darkness only dominates when there's no light. And so sometimes I need to bring whatever's going on inside of me into the light. And I'm like, hey, brother, uh, help me do this. I want to get this out in the light, too. I'm, hey, can you battle this with me? Help pray for me. Come uh, come, and, and come alongside of me. And so this time at the end of service is for that. It's for us to come for our Lord. God, help renew me. Yeah. Get my wiring right. And hey, if, I, if you need a battle partner, you say, I know this is a spiritual war. Hey, pastor, can you come agree with me on this? Help, help me pray that this, that this stronghold in my life will, will be broken, will be taken, will be rewired, will be reworked so that I can experience the freedom God has for me. And guess what? We're going to come alongside of you. Right? Come alongside of you and pray, huh? The light side always wins. <laughs> the light side always wins. Amen. Unfortunately, man, sometimes we get in the dark. Like I said a few weeks ago, sometimes we get in the dark and we just say, you know what, I, I'm comfortable here. I just, I'll just adapt to it. There's more. Amen. There's freedom. Man, a picture of my house just keep on coming back into my mind. Going to our house, they've been, they've been without electricity for a month, without water for a month. They had like wax candles so they could light the house and the wax was everywhere. I'm like, how could they live that way? Mold everywhere. It was disgusting. But we're comfortable. The way we thought, the way we live life. We weren't meant to live that way. You're not meant to live stuck. So if some kind of bad thought pattern can become our subconscious mode of operation, don't you believe that if we believe on the light and receive the truth, that that can become our mode of operation? So then all of a sudden as I'm living and some kind of stressful thing happens and all of a sudden the goodness of the Lord and the kindness of the Lord overwhelms me instead of the anger and the rage that used to overwhelm me. It becomes my subconscious just the way I live. When I come here on Sunday mornings, I don't worship because I have to consciously think about 
okay, God, are you worthy? Are you worth it? And I'll have to go through those steps. And it's, uh, it's renewed my mind enough that, God, I know that you're worthy. So when I'm raising my hands on Sunday morning, it's not because I'm thinking, oh, I've got to raise my hands because I'm a pastor and everybody's watching. And I have to think through the, all the steps and logically think, okay, God, are you worthy? No, all of a sudden, it's just automatic. God, you're worthy. You're worth it. And that's the kind of rewiring, that's the kind of reworking that God wants to do in our life, that the subconscious, that our mode of operation is God. It's His goodness. It's His character. Man, if the enemy can do that to your life, Jesus' life can also. He can renew your mind. Believe in what God says is greater, even if it's different than how you see it with your own eyes. God, help me. Yes. I said that a couple weeks ago. This was one of my favorite prayers. Man, God, help me. Help me to believe this. Help me to be yes. true of me. Yes. God, it's different. It's hard for me. I love a, a passage in uh, Joshua chapter 5 kind of demonstrates this in a natural way. It gives us a picture of this whole idea. Joshua chapter 5 is, is a story of Jericho. Joshua and the, the Israelites, they're marching through the land. They come up against Jericho. Jericho was a strong city. It was a fortified city. It had it not it was it was not a huge city, but it was it was strong. It had two different walls. They, they used to have chariot races on the top of the wall. And it was so big, it was so massive, it was so strong. And the children of Israel were going to go before it, and, and Joshua went to look at it, and and, and man. In the natural, uh, Joshua was a warrior. He had already conquered the cities that he had already conquered. He's getting ready. He's taking victories, and he gets before this, and he, he has his sword in his hand. He's ready to go, go fight. Yeah. Let's go. Let's go conquer the city. And angel, the angel of the Lord appears to him. Kind of, it's kind of like an Old Testament representation of Christ. The angel of the Lord appears to him. It says, "Wait, Joshua, that's not how you're going to do this one." And he's like, man, I got the plan. I mean, he's a military man, he's a warrior. He, he knows how to take over a city. He had the plan. And he said, no, nope, you're not going to do that. Actually, what you're going to do is you're going to circle around the city. You know how crazy that sounds? Say, what? He, he, Joshua, at the moment, got so upset about this. He was like, man, you want to take his sword and cut down the, cut down the angel of the Lord? He said, oh, wait a second. Dude. What are you talking about? I'm going to... And then all of a sudden he realized who he was talking to. He bowed down before him and he worshipped him. And the instructions were what? That they would put the Ark of the Covenant, which represented the presence of God, and they put the priests and the worshippers, they put them at the front of the line, and they're going to just have a worship party for six days all around the stronghold. They're going to focus on the presence of God. They're going to focus on the priest. They're going to focus on the word. They're going to focus on God. And as they walk around, they're not going to worry about the stronghold. They're not going to keep their eye on it. They're not going to give it attention. Man, they're on top of the. They're on top of the. You can read the story. They're on top of it. The, they're jeering them. They're laughing at them. What are you doing? That's so weird. What? And we all got those voices sometimes. And sometimes they're. Sometimes they're going to be honest. They're internal. Andrew, what are you thinking? Come on, it would just be easier to go to this way. It was just better. It was more comfortable. Got to put in the hard work. Got to go towards the presence of God. I'm going to get more of God. I'm going to walk. I'm going to keep on walking. And, if, and, and you, get this, you get this picture of it in the Old Testament. But I think it's a, it's a picture of what we, it would look like for us in, in today. Is that, hey, there's a stronghold. There's a situation in our life. There's a pattern of thoughts in our life that has, has been producing bad fruit in our life. And guess what? We're not going to give it the attention. To it. We're not going to try to overcome it with our own strength. We're going to say, you know what, Jesus? I'm going to put you at the center. I'm going to walk towards you. I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to seek your presence. I'm going to be in your presence. And God, I know that when I do that, you're going to renew my mind. You're going to take down the stronghold because the battle is the Lord. It's not mine. I'm going to keep on going, and I seek this faith, and as I keep on going, as I pray, as I read His Word, as I listen, as I get more of Him, I receive what He has for me. They overcame a stronghold, a city, by a shout. 
by not raising the issue, but raising the king. Mm -hmm. That's right. Come on. With God, all things are possible. I love that verse because that verse right there is talking specifically about salvation. It's talking specifically about the restoration of life. There's Jesus talking with them, and he said it's hard. It's hard for rich people to get into the kingdom of God. That's what the whole passage was. It's harder than for them for them to get into the kingdom of God than for a camel to get through the eye of a needle. And he's talking about whether, whether Jesus was talking about a physical eye of a needle or if he was talking about a specific gate on the city. Either way, it was impossible. In their minds, the disciples knew that was an impossible thing. And he said, and, but what was the answer? In the natural, basically what Jesus said, in the natural, it's impossible. But in the supernatural, with my divine power, it's possible Amen. that all people would come to Christ. It is, in the natural, your problem and your habit and your situation may seem really large and may be, seem really difficult, but in the supernatural, it's possible. That God will overcome all these things. You don't need to change your job. You don't need to change your location. You don't need to change some kind of outward situation. You don't need to get a new spouse. You don't need to flee. You don't need. You need more of Jesus, and when you get more of Him, the impossible becomes possible. There's freedom. There's freedom. Get more light. Man, I just changed the light bulbs in my in my living room recently. And I remember the first time you walked in, you're like, it's bright in here. Yeah, some of us need to change our spiritual light bulb. Maybe get a few more lamps in our get a few more lamps. Bring more in. Bring it in. Bring in the light. How do you get it? Read your word. Pray. No. Yeah, it's understand. Everything I can. Renew my mind. Read a book or do something. Renew me, God. Help me think like you. Sometimes I still get caught up in my own pleasures, in my own will, in my own desires. So what's the strategy? Next week we're going to be talking about uh, in, we're going to talk about uh, vows, words, the power of words in our life. How do we overcome the words in our life? So I want we're going to talk about those next week. Strategy for how do we get free. One, identify, capture the wrong thought. And, and some of us, uh, you may need help capturing the wrong thought. Hey, we've got brothers and sisters in the room. We've got brothers and sisters in the family. You say, hey, come to me. Hey, can we have coffee? Gonna let out? I need some help identifying where this wrong thought is. And, hey, we'll start, we'll start putting some words to it. Because it I'm telling you, it's not the problem. It's not whatever you're facing or whatever you're looking at in the natural. Okay? There's a deeper truth that you have unbelief about. There's a deeper thing that's going on inside of you that God wants to bring freedom to so true repentance can take place. How do I identify? Identify. First strategy. Identify. Capture that thought that doesn't line up with God's word. Take it captive. Very different things. I'm not loved. No, it's wrong. You are loved. You're a child of God. Your feeling of not love may lead you to these destructive behaviors, but the truth that will set you free from them is that you are a child of God, that you are loved by Him, that you are significant. That's right. Right? Two, declare that over your life. Declare the truth over your life. You may have to verbally say it. Yes, God has a plan for my life. I don't have to worry about the future. I don't have to be stuck in worry. I don't have to. Uh, I don't have to be in so fear of making a decision because if I make the wrong decision, all of a sudden, no, I don't have to fear about that. God's in control of my life. I want to declare that He has a plan for me. He has a future for me. It's going to be true in my life. Yeah. Declare that truth over you. What does that mean? Sometimes it means memorizing. Get a little. Get little index cards out. Man, the, I love the fact that that Brian and, and Richard have the kids memorizing scripture. We need to, as adults, memorize scripture too. Why? Because it gets that truth inside of me. Yes. It helps me re rewire. Yes, it's true, God. You call me your son. 
that I, because the Spirit inside of me, can call you my Father. And then the third thing, strategy, one, identify it, two, declare that truth over you, memorize it, get it in you, read it, put it on the mirror, put it on the, the car and your visor, so you can, every time you get in the car, you flip it down, read that, read, help renew that truth in my, life, in my heart. And third, Get good at saying, I need you, God. Yeah. Come on.